Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I was just uh, checking which bits of ICFP I was crashing with, and apparently what I'm crashing with is lunch. So, um, <laughs> thank you for coming. <laughs> now, as you see, I've worked very hard on my slides this time. Uh, this is, I don't know what Beamer theme this is. Text file. Um, so the title of this talk, uh, Programming is a Conversation, this is, this is coincidentally uh, the title of a project, well not very coincidentally, the title of a project that I'm about to begin and I'm going to say right up front, I'm going to be hiring someone soon to work on this stuff. So if uh, so this is kind of postdoc uh, research on, on implementing things in Idris. So if that interests you, please come and talk to me um, afterwards. If, if what I'm about to talk about interests you, please come and talk to me later. Uh, okay, so uh, I've got a little plan for the talk. Essentially the plan is uh, um, I'm going to write programs at you. Uh, but I do want to check, because I'm going to write programs in a text editor, and I was just at the back earlier, it's kind of hard to see this. Is this big enough to, to be in your thumbs up at the back? Good. Brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, what am I going to do? Um, for a while now, um, I've been working on this new implementation of Idris. So just out of curiosity, has anyone played a bit with Idris, just by way of show of hands? Okay, that's pretty good. That's about half the audience, so that's nice. One thing that you might have... Um, uh, discovered if you've been playing with Idris is that it gets a little bit sluggish sometimes and this is something that's been driving me crazy because you know I'm, I'm using this thing so I, I really wanted to go back and re-engineer the thing re-engineer some of the core features that made this happen and if I'm going to re-engineer it I might as well try implementing it in itself you know what could possibly go wrong Let's find out uh, find out how hard it is if, if the system is good enough to do that and to see what kinds of ways that, uh, that I can use dependent types to, uh, to make the system work a bit better. Um, so that's really a talk for another time, that's just a background on why I did this. What I'm going to do today is show you the state of the, the, state of the system as it is, uh, just work from the beginning. So since a lot of you didn't put your hands up on playing with Idris there, I think that's a sign that I should probably go back to the beginning and just show you the philosophy of how things work. But I want to, if you have seen Idris before, I'm going to show you some of the new things that have come in as a result of re-engineering the core theory um, and, and what we can do with them. So here's the hypothesis of, of type-driven development. Is, um, I mean, it's, it's not really a testable hypothesis, which makes it a very bad hypothesis, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, the idea is precise types with the right tools enhance programmer productivity. So we've seen dependent types in the last couple of talks for uh, proofs of correctness and for, for having more confidence that your program does the right thing. I mean, that's brilliant, that's something we want, but I'm thinking of them as much as a way of, of having this conversation with the machine where um, like you say up front, hey machine, I've had this brilliant idea, this is the thing we're going to work on, and then by interactively you know, asking the machine questions, the machine gives you some feedback, you eventually arrive at the program, you eventually arrive at a realization of the idea that you presented to the machine. So, um, so yeah, we'll see a bit, of, uh, a bit of quantities, we'll see a bit of resource tracking. If we, if we have enough time, uh, we'll get to an example of type-safe concurrent programming. So that's, that's where we're aiming at in the end here. But before we do that, I need to go right <coughs> back to the beginning and show you what I think dependent types are all about, what I mean by dependent types. So I think the idea, the fundamental idea to me is that in a dependently typed languages, types are first class. So when, um, uh, certainly when I explain functional programming to our, to our undergraduates when I teach them Haskell, uh, so at that point they've done about 18 months of Java. So, I, uh, so I, I show them this completely different thing and it kind of polarizes the class, as you'd expect. <laughs> uh, but I say to them, the key thing in Haskell is functions are first class. That is, you can send functions to functions, you can return functions, you can manipulate them in various ways. Well, in a dependently typed language, that's the same, same as that is true for types. Types are first class things. You can pass types to functions, you can return types from functions. As we'll see, we can inspect types at runtime. It's kind of a cool thing to be able to do. So, um, as an example, just to, just to illustrate that for the simplest possible case, we could write a function that computes a type based on some Boolean input. So what you see here uh, is a bunch of type declarations, um, and I'm going to interact with the editor to write a program. So, uh, first thing I'll do, this, this function int or char takes a boolean, gives back a type. If I hit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what keys I'm pressing, you can't see what keys I'm pressing, but I, I hit control alt a for add definition, and it will add a candidate defini a definition of this function. And this is probably the single most important thing to take away from this talk. Holes are really cool. 
Holes are <coughs> bits of your program that you haven't written yet, but you can inspect them, find out about the environment uh, that, that led to that hole, and um, you know, that, that's part of the conversation where the, the type checker is telling you something it knows about your program. So, just one bit of philosophy here. Um, type checkers or compilers know an awful lot of stuff about your half-finished program, but they usually keep it to themselves, and that's very sad. Type checkers have a lot of information. We need to have ways of interacting with the type checker uh, so that it gives away some of the information that is figured out about your program. In this case, it hasn't figured out anything particularly exciting, but we'll have a look anyway. If I hit Control or T, we see, is this high enough up? Is that visible? Can you maybe full, uh, make it full screen? Uh, this kind of is full screen. It's full screen. Um, I mean, I can scroll that down, but it just gets lower. Oops. This is a very, very high resolution. It's, I have to play this game. <laughs> I've only had this computer a few weeks, and I haven't figured out how it works yet. Uh, oh, there's a button up there, isn't it? That one. Great. And I probably didn't help, but there we go. Um, let's scroll that up. Let's have, how about that? Uh, so what, what we're seeing here is that it knows that isn't is a bool. It knows that we're trying to get a type. So the sort of things we can do are case splits on this. So if I do a case split on isInt, it will give me the two possibilities for uh, what a bool can be. And if I check the right-hand side now, it's, it's I mean, let's, let's fill this in. So the idea is if it's an int, we return an int. If it's not an int, um, we return a child. The sort of things you can do if you, have a, a, if you have a function that computes a type is you can use it in a type. And it's, it's just an ordinary function. There's no different syntax. It's, like, it's literally the same language at the type level and at the value level. So sometimes uh, I read these amazing blog posts where someone has done a type level quick sort in Scala or something like that, and it's, uh, it's fantastic that someone's actually managed to do that. And I just think, well, I just put the thing the other side of the colon. So, I mean, what's the problem? So, <laughs> so um, if, you like the, if you like the sort of thing that people can do with dependent types in Scala, have a go at Idris. So, wh so where would you use this function? A function that computes a type, you'd use it in a type. So. Um, this is kind of a silly function that takes a boolean and then it takes a thing that it's the type of that thing is computed from this function int or char and we'll see uh, probably the second most important thing after holes is so we look at the whole show thing uh, oops I need to save that first show thing RHS we see that we've got an is int and then we've got an x and we've got this hint here this clue that to find out anything about x we need to know a bit more about is int so the next most important thing is that looking at the value of one thing can tell you about the value of another thing. Now, this is really not surprising to anyone who's written a program. Looking at things tells you about other things. We can make assumptions that, I don't know, let's say we have two lists of the same length, and we write the program with that assumption, um, but that doesn't necessarily help the machine get us to the program. So if we've got those assumptions, if we're making those assumptions, we can make those assumptions explicit to the machine, then it gives us more... It gives the machine more information that it can help us with. Okay, so um, if you'll show it on this second example instead. So just to show that types really are first class and you really can put anything in a type, I'll just put your, your, your ordinary everyday if then else expression in the type. So uh, for this, this slightly more complex example. So if I do a, if I check the type of um, show thing prime, it says again there's this clue that we have to do something with x. Uh, I'll do a case split on it. And if we check these resulting holes, we'll see that in the first case, the type of x is refined. So this is information that we won't get until runtime, but we can reason about what happens if at compile time. So that's really the, 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 probably the most interesting thing that's happening in the type system, is that we can reason about, at compile time, what's actually going to happen at runtime. Essentially what this works out as is, if you need to do a dynamic check, the type checker tells you where you need to do the dynamic checks. So, if you need to check something for a program to be meaningful, the type checker will tell you that that has to happen. Anyway, I'm not going to finish this example. This is just to illustrate what happens with the interactive editing. I'm going to move on to the... Um, I, I am going to do this. <laughs> um, if, if you've seen dependent types before, you've seen vectors before, but I'm going to show you something slightly different about vectors. And this is why I, show, this is why I like to show, always come back to vectors, is people have seen vectors before, and if there's something new, the new thing will, I hope, uh, leap out at you. So the new thing about, um, uh, about uh, quantitative type theory, the new thing about the type theory that Idris 2 is based on, is that every binder, that is every variable,
has a quantity associated with it. Um, so a while ago I was having a conversation in a pub with a cryptographer and an accountant, and a, well, it's not a joke, this actually happened. <laughs> uh, and, and we were talking, as you do, about what we considered big numbers. So like the accountant had just signed off a really small account for about a million pounds that day, and the cryptographer was, like, he was getting up to 128 bits. And I said, yeah, a big number in my world is two. So the interesting numbers in this system are zero, one, and don't care. So zero means we don't have it at runtime. One means we have a thing that we use, we have to use exactly once at runtime, and then don't care is, well, we're basically back in the original Idris world. Now, this is important because, so if you were in Stephanie's talk, there was this discussion about um, singleton types and how you can have these double duty um, data that, that, that work in the type and in the value. And this is really useful to have, but you really need to know what is going to end up in your program and what isn't. So the really useful thing about having a zero is that you have a type level guarantee that this bit of information is going to be raised at runtime. So this is the new thing we'll see about vectors. So we've got a pend here. This is a, given a vector of n things and a vector of n things, we get back the vector of n, n plus n things. Great. Uh, that's how we'd expect a pen to work. So I'll, do, I'll add a candidate definition and we'll look at the right hand side, the hole on the right hand side. So we see what we have here. We've got an M, an A, and an N, so these, these things from the type, the length, the, 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 the element type, and we've got X's and Y's. Um, but we have these mysterious zeros next to M, A, and N. So that means these things are going to be erased at runtime, which means that we are not allowed to do any kind of case analysis on them here. Because if we do case analysis, that implies that this is going to be. Uh, runtime relevant data. Um, so, just a little bit more information that we can give to the type checker. That little bit more information will help this conversation we're having with the type checker. It's like, you know, if you tell someone your brilliant idea, but you don't tell them the details of, the, of your brilliant idea, then um, they're not going to be able to help you as much with your brilliant idea. So, our brilliant idea is to add two vectors. Uh, the usual, so the usual, I'll just do this quickly. So, the usual thing to do is a case split on the first thing. We'll see how that's refined the type of the whole. So uh, in the first case, we're returning a vector. Of, we've got a vector of m things. We need a vector of m things. So if we do a search for that, we should be able to find it, because it's, like, it's just there. And then in the second case, I'm sure you've all seen this before, we've got, uh, we're trying to make a vector of k plus m things. We've got a vector of k things, a vector of m things. We've got another thing. So if we do a search, we can put them together. Great. So the, the, type, has, uh, the type has helped us get to the program. It's helped the machine get us to the program. Now, at this point, so I've been doing this particular example for about a thousand years now, and at, at this point somebody usually asks, you know, that's nice, but you were kind of doing the same thing there. You, you kind of, you always do these case splits and searches, and surely, like, when you, when you write a program and you find that you've repeatedly written something down in the code, you tend to abstract over that, or you, you, you like to once you've done it a few times, you like to abstract over that and, and, and not have to write the same program over and over again. What I want to do here is kind of, I guess, uh, abstract over the process of programming. I want to abstract over myself editing. Like, I've done this a few times. I've got a case split operation in the system. I've got a search operation in the system. If I hit Control-Alt-G, let's just undo all of that. If I hit Control-Alt-G, it basically does a, you know, Generate and test Edwin, and and and, uh, and out comes the program. It's pretty cool that, it, that this. I mean, it's, it's literally just split, search, see what happens. Keep splitting and searching up to a maximum depth. Um, the maximum depth is two, I think. Um, <laughs> it doesn't need to be much deeper than that. Um, so for zip width, for example, um, do the same thing. Out comes zip width. Great. So um, I guess also at this point, sometimes sometimes when you're doing this, the, the, so again, this is. We've given the machine some information. The machine has been able to help us. Sometimes it turns out the information we've given the machine isn't quite right. So this is um, a pen here in particular, is relying on a, a coincidence between uh, a relationship between numbers and lists. So there is a relationship between numbers and lists, in that lists are kind of numbers annotated with. <laughs> Um, if you imagine a number line and all the data hanging off all the points on the uh, hooks on points on the number line, that's what lists are. There's this this relationship. So exploiting that relationship, I've already implemented plus. So why should I have to implement append? And this sort of thing, this sort of thing comes up quite a bit. But it does mean that if I 
kind of misuse that relationship. What happens if I get M and N the wrong way around? Um, so uh, there's, a, there, there's always a clue. When the machine gives you more stuff than you thought, you've probably got it wrong. This does actually do something. It, uh, it, gives, you, um, it gives you a list of the first elements, and then it just puts the rest of the list on the end when it's got enough stuff. Um, but, so you have to, this, none of this frees you from thinking about what you're doing. So asking the machine a question, if you get an incomprehensible answer, I mean, if you're having a conversation with someone and, and uh, you describe your idea and they say something that they think is helpful but is kind of, doesn't really make sense, you say, oh, no, no, let, let me refine my idea a bit. Let me explain my idea a bit better. Well, that's what's happening here. This is, so we need to explain this idea a bit better. We need to explain uh, the relationship between numbers and lists a bit better. Okay, so I just want to show you a few examples of, of how, how that might work um, uh, in, 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 in practice. So, like, I show these, these little examples, and, and, I mean, it's a magic trick. It really is just a magic trick. There's, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a brute force search. Uh, there, there is really nothing clever going on. But it's amazing how far you can get. I mean, if you've seen, <laughs> seen people doing magic tricks, you can see some amazing effects with just a tiny little bit of sleight of hand. Um, the sort of place where it turns out to be useful is if you're doing some kind of plumbing with, um, you know, um, with tuples and or monadic plumbing or something like that, where it's like, I know what this program is supposed to do. I'm going to have to think a little bit to make this program work. Let's have the machine think for me. I've put the effort into writing down the type. Let's have the machine think for me. So these, I just picked out three examples from the, uh, from the GIN documentation. So I've got Lennox here, so I think he implemented GIN in the first place. You know, Jin is this tool for generating uh, programs from Haskell types based on some of uh, Roy Dickhoff's work on proof search. So, um, so basically, I taught it about um, first and second. So, you know, outcomes on curry, uh, outcomes curry, outcomes this kind of thing that pulls stuff out of lists. So, this sort of thing is kind of handy if uh, when you're when you're doing some manipulation of lots of data and you're trying to pull out just bits of that data. The other sort of place where it comes in handy is um, if I have some predicate on some data. Like I, I so this is a this is a, um, a heterogeneous list type. Uh, so we saw if, if you were in ICFP yesterday, we saw one of these in um, I think it was uh, Tongo Kiss's talk, if I remember rightly. Uh, uh, so the idea here is we've got a, a list parameterized over some types. So every element in the list, in the heterogeneous list, has a type given by its index. So if we want to pull something out of that list, we need to know what type it's going to be. So maybe the sort of thing you, you might use this for is for um, an extensible record type, for example. So if you're doing a projection from your extensible record, you need to explain that the thing you're pulling out is really of the right type. So that's what this predicate here does. So pull out the thing at position 0, it has type T. If the thing at position K has type T, then the position of k plus 1 in a bigger list also has type t. So at this point, once we've written this predicate, we've kind of written the function. This is, this is all the work that you need to do to pull out something from a list. So it's kind of annoying that we have to write the function again. So the thing with, if we have this way of interacting with the machine where we tell it things and the machine splits stuff and searches for us, then it turns out all of that machinery, again, just gives us the program. And it really should. We've already written the program. So um, I don't know if you'd see that thing at the bottom. This is basically predicting a thing out of our heterogeneous list. So we've done the work, so we don't have to do the work again. That's the, that's the goal. Right, so um, this only works, by the way, if you make your type checker fast enough to, to do the searches and do the checking. So, so it was really worth going back and re-implementing some of that core engineering you know, do, actually doing the engineering rather than just my research quality hacking that I typically do. Because then you really can ask the machine a lot of questions and get a lot of answers in, in reasonable time. So I hope it's obvious that there isn't a particularly long pause when I'm doing that. It's kind of nice. Right, so that's, um, that's the basic idea of, of interactive editing. Let's see some more quantities, though. So you've seen these zeros. You've seen these zeros cropping up in, uh, in the types. See a bit more about how that could be useful in practice. So, um, uh, so the intuition here, uh, it, so you, you'll see here, this, this, is a, um, this is a function that takes a thing and makes a pair of those things. But I've put this quantity here that says you can only use that thing once. So you may be ahead of me, and we're already in trouble here. 
But let's let's go with it. The intuition is the your, the intuition behind this is if you see um, a function f of type one x and a to b, that means if f of x is used once, then x is used once. So it's not a it's not a guarantee that your argument hasn't been shared in the past, which means, unfortunately, we don't get things like yet. We don't yet get things like you can turn off the garbage collector. But it is a promise that we won't share it in the future, uh, which turns out to be kind of valuable for things like uh, resource tracking, um, checking that channels are only send messages once on channels, that kind of thing. Anyway, I'm going to do something fairly simple with it here. I'm going to try writing this pair function, and we'll see where it goes wrong. So. Um, so the only thing I'm going to, I, I could try searching, but it's not going to, it's not going to work. So I'll, we'll, I'll put a couple of uh, holes in. Um, oops. See, I keep pressing the wrong button because I'm not used to this <laughs> keyboard. Um, so if we check the type of foo here, we'll see that we have, so we can talk about A, but we can't use it because it's got a zero next to it. Uh, we have exactly one X. So we're allowed to use x. I, if I look at pair RHS, so the, the other thing, um, it's exactly the same thing. So, so the type checker is not making any judgments about where we can use x. So it's just in one of these things. So if I fill in foo with an oops, if I fill in foo, it might even search. Does it work? Oh, it, does, it does work. So uh, successfully, um, that's not what I meant. Uh, it successfully uh, searches for x. Great. But if I look at Whoops, I didn't reload it. Um, I don't know why. The, the Atom plugin on Mac reloads it, and the Atom plugin on Linux doesn't, and I don't understand. I don't understand computers. So, anyway, um, so if you look at pair RHS now, we see that X, X has a zero next to it because we've used it. We can still talk about it. This is good news if we're reasoning about things. So, if we want to, um, if we want to have some kind of proof of how x was used, we can still have that proof because proofs are compile time only. Proofs are going to get erased. So anywhere you see something with a zero, you can use it in a place, that in, in a kind of zero context, in an erased context, but we can't use it in a program. So if I try using it here um, and reload it, it says something very small. I don't know how to make that bigger, uh, but I'll read it out. It says, um, there are two uses of linear name x. So this is now an error. And again, since, since people sometimes ask, like what happens if x is used in the second position? Because what's the type of foo at this point? So um, we, do, we do at least see that um, if x is used anywhere else in the term, well, it's spent. We can't use it again. Right. We, we're not going to be able to write that. I'll delete it. Just to give a, I mean, we show these examples of program search. And we give a bit of information in the type to show that uh, a program, uh, like a, a, a vector, uh, has n elements, so if we map, it still has to have n elements. Turns out, if you have these annotations, you don't need that anymore. Um, so we can actually make types a bit less complicated by adding a bit more to the type system. Right? We, we can say here that, so this, this linear map, we've got a list that we're going to use exactly once. If we're going to use that list exactly once, we are going to have to like look at the whole list. And to turn out, to get a list of b out, I'm going to have to run f. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, we're not going to be able to get the bees out. So it turns out we've already given enough information um, for, for generating a program to work here, which I think is kind of nice. I mean, that wasn't intended. So that's, that's just something that drops out of the type system. So it's always nice when you put a thing in the type system, and it gives you something you didn't expect. Um, uh, just a bit more before I move on to the, the last example of, of uh, resource tracking. Um, if you, once you've added quantities, you, you've now added a, a distinction between um, a parametric for all binding and a non-parametric for all binding. So um, I've always wanted to have type case. That is, I've always wanted to be able to inspect types at runtime in order to maybe pick a, a more efficient uh, specific version of a function uh, or to do a bit of generic programming. Uh, but someone always says, but, 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 parametricity which is a legitimate thing to worry about. But if you have this distinction between um, for all bindings that you can look at and for all bindings that you can't, well, you haven't lost parametricity. So I've got a thing here that um, turns a type into a string, so just a, a case split on a type. And I've got this thing down the bottom, which is, which is not an identity function. It has a type that looks a little bit like the... I'll, I'll move that up a bit. Um, 
a type that looks a little bit like the type of an identity function, but actually isn't, because this thing here, there's no quantity on this. That means this type can be used at runtime, so, um, so we don't get the, the guarantees that you get from you know, parametricity, but if I were to <coughs> stick a zero in there, suddenly we do. Anyway, I haven't found a use for this yet, but I'm sure there is one. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure there'll be, uh, you know, an audience like this is bound to be creative enough to come up with a, with a fun example of, of, of looking at types, uh, types of runtime. Generic programming. But yeah, um, yes, I expect generic programming. There, there will be some really nice tricks you can do for generic programming with this, but we might have to give a little bit more, uh, a little bit more information uh, for it to work really well. But we should try it. Please have a go. You know, let's ha help us find out what this can do. Anyway, so how am I doing for time? I've got about 15 minutes left, is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good time to move on to, to basically to show you the door. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the thing I really wanted, I mean, it's, the thing I find dependent types useful for, um, apart from, you know, keeping me off the streets, is um, inter explaining interactions with the outside world. Um, so explaining how kind of ugly stuff outside the program uh, uh, interacts with, uh, with the program. So uh, that would be things like you know, opening files. So you, you might want to only read from a file if it's open for reading. Or, or you might want to only send a message over a network when the protocol is expecting that particular kind of message. So I've, um, I've spent a while coming up with all kinds of complicated encodings to do this in the type system in a nice composable way. And a couple of years ago, with QTT, uh, Bob Atkey and Conor McBride basically said, stop doing that, do it this easy way instead. Uh, so I think this, I think this is a, uh, a more explainable way to do it. So the door example, we have, um, imagine you have a door with like a robotic arm attached to it or something. So the door can be in uh, one of two states, open or closed. Uh, we can ask it to open, we can ask it to close. Doesn't make sense to ask it to open if it's already open or close if it's already closed. We can knock on it at any point, or maybe I have to be ring doorbell, because uh, knocking on an open door, I guess it's legitimate, but it's an odd thing to do. Um, <clears throat> so, um, without worrying too much about what these types mean, I'll show you in a moment what these types mean exactly, um, or, or how they work. Um, what they mean is, so this L1, so this is kind of like, um, so the, the M is suggestive of something. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a, a program with potentially linear values that runs in some context. So M stands for some context. Um, so uh, a new door is, uh, a new door gives us back a door that we can use exactly once. Knock takes that door, promises to use it exactly once, and gives us back another door that's used exactly once. So it's like a state transition. Uh, there's no state transition happening here, but it's a uh, potential state transition. I'll look at closed door uh, next, come back to open door. So given one door, given a door that we use once that is currently open, that gives us back uh, a door that we can use once that is closed. So here you really can see the state transition in the type. Uh, open door is a little bit more complicated because our robotic arm, I don't know, maybe it needs a bit of WD-40. So maybe it doesn't work, maybe the door jams. So, we're not completely in control of the environment here. We're in control of what we're asking the environment to do, but the state transition isn't necessarily to open the door. We're only going to find out at runtime. So this res type, I'm not going to tell you what the res type is. I'm going to show you in a moment by, by means of conversation with the machine. Essentially, it's saying, it's explaining how we know whether the door opened or closed. So let's, uh, let's write a program to open and close the door. That's all we're going to do. Um, so the first thing we'll do, um, well, is add a few lines at the bottom so that you can see it at the back. Uh, the first thing we'll do is create a new door, and every time we do something, oh, why did it do that? Stop it. Um, the, every time we do something, it's a good idea to look at the type of the hole just to see how it's updated the the context. So in my in my dream world, this would just be something that if I had the if I had this uh, visible, it would just keep updating as I edited the program. So um, maybe that will happen one day. But what we see now is we have, we have a door that we have to use once that is currently closed. So what can we do with it? We can knock on it. Uh, let's knock on it. And I'll, I'll call the result D prime just so that you can see what's uh, happened more clearly. 
So we see now that D has D is spent. So we can't use D again, but we can use D prime. Um, we can talk about D. We can reminisce about the glorious days <laughs> when we had D. Um, but we can't have D again. <laughs> There's so many things that I'm not saying out loud at this point. <laughs> so uh, let's just call it D. It's easier if we call it D. Uh, let's, so let's try opening the door. And uh, I didn't tell you what happened when, uh, with the result of a door open operation, but we'll, we'll find out in a moment. So we'll try opening that door. What do we get? Um, well, we don't necessarily get an open door because it might not work. So this, this res is, is kind of like a pair type. So the first thing is the result of the operation, and then we have a function that calculates. So this is, remember at the beginning when I showed you this, this, this you probably thought, why is he showing us this ridiculous thing with if then else in the type? That couldn't possibly ever be useful. This is where it's useful. So here we have an if then else in a type that's calculating whether the door is open or closed based on some bit of information that we're going to get at runtime. So I will, uh, normally what, what you do if you, um, if you have some uh, object and you don't know what to do with it, just try a case split on it, see what happens. This is, say to the machine, what happens if we, uh, if we do that case split? So, um, I don't know, let's call it help. Uh, so, oh, just uh, no, always look at the hole for what's happened. We've spent OK now, we can't use OK again, but we can, we can use help. So I'll do a case split on help, and, oh, we've, we've, we've now learned, um, oops, We've now learned that a res is a pair of a val and a resource. So we have a val of type bool. We have a resource. That's the door that we're interested in. And we'll learn more about the door <laughs> if we know something more about val. So what do you reckon we might do? I guess we're going to have to case split on val. And I'll, um, so this is, this is a situation where, um, I wish we wouldn't do that. This is, <laughs> come on. Okay, don't save it. Saving it causes it to move things around. Why not? Software. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it works. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so we'll see in this, uh, in the case where this is true, where, where it was successful, we see now that the door is open. And in the case where it was unsuccessful, we see the doors closed. So the type system, this is a case where the type system is telling us not only that we have to do a dynamic check, but it's also giving us some, I think, valuable information about what to do as a result of that dynamic check. Now, for doors, this is clearly a made up thing. I'm not going to be able to run this program uh, yet because I haven't got a hardware attachment. But, I mean, what sort of situations might you encounter where knowing the state of things, knowing when you can do operations as well as what operations you can do is important. Because really that's what we've done here, is in the type system, like type, we are by now used to type systems being able to tell or telling us um, uh, what we can do. But we're not used to type systems telling us exactly when we can do them. So um, the sort of situation where I think that really matters is protocols, communication protocols. Um, so. We send a value, we expect to receive a value. We expect to receive a value of a particular type. Now, I don't really have time to go into the details of all of this, but I've been hacking up uh, an implementation of session types. So if you see session types, they're a way of describing communication protocols and types. You could use them for concurrency, distributed systems, all kinds of things. If you have uh, linear and dependent types, you basically have session types uh, with a little bit of encoding. And you even have dependent session types. So um, here I have so this, this little program. I have a, a way of describing protocols. So our protocol here is that um, uh, a client will request, will send a request of a Boolean. And depending on whether that was true or false, so if it was true, the server will send back a character. If it was false, the server will send back a string. So it's, just, it's like uh, the Boolean is the command to the server. And then what comes back is going to be different depending on that command. So then a client, so there's a little bit of work, so this client test proto, this is a type level function that, uh, I mean, this is, this is the advantage of having type level functions that are just in the language, is you don't have to think about a different way of writing it in different contexts, you just do it. So this, given this protocol, we can, we can work out the type of a channel for a client, and that channel, will, uh, that channel type will basically say, 
uh, what we have to do at each stage of the protocol. So, um, I mean, this pro I, I can show that this program type checks, but it's kind of more interesting if I if I comment a bit of it out and, and leave a hole. And this is where this is where the conversation with the machine starts happening. Is that by looking at the type of foo, we can see what has to happen next. So the only thing you really need to look at is the next thing on the channel. So the next thing to do on this channel is to send a bool, and then some stuff happens depending on what that bool was. So uh, let's let's send a false on that channel. So right, the next thing we have to do is receive a string. If we send true, the next thing we have to do is receive a character. Now I don't know about you, but there is absolutely no way I would write a concurrent program that sent a different type back depending on a different value that I've been sending it if I didn't have a computer to keep me straight. So I think this, this means we can start, being, we start writing much more interesting uh, concurrent programming protocols uh, and be confident that we've, got, uh, that we've got them right. And also be confident that, um, you know, let's imagine someone, someone offers us a lot of money to, to send back two strings, or to send back two characters, then this is the fearless refactoring bit. I'm going to get a type error if I change the protocol. So um, there you go. It says it went wrong. I'm not going to read it. Um, so this, this turns out to scale up to quite an interesting thing. So not only can I send values back and forward, I can send entire channels back and forward. So maybe I, what I want to do is write a server which just sends back channels that are, that are individual interfaces that I can send messages on. So I can do that fearlessly now because you know, I'll write a, where are we? Um, oh, actually, yeah, we, we can um, um, sort of say that, uh, where is it? Here we are. So we, we can write a protocol that says, we'll request a Boolean. If the Boolean is true, send us back another channel. If the Boolean is false, shut down the entire system. So you know, it, it's basically going to send back a client that can talk on this protocol. So we can, start doing, we can start building up quite sophisticated things with this just by the mechanism that we used to open and close the door. Exactly the same mechanism scales up to these interesting problems. Uh, I just realized I didn't show you anything running. I'm going to show you this running just to... Um, so, um, uh, I mean, the thing about dependently typed programming is that you know it works, so why would you bother running it? <laughs> Some people say that, and they seem to mean it. Um, I don't mean it. I, I think it's kind of... A, the, the whole point of this is to have a thing that, uh, that works. So, um, oops, what did I break? I didn't save it, did I? I oh, know I said that. <laughs> I do this because um, I want you to show that it's actually doing something. Oh, also, I, I, I've got to change this. It says "enjoy yourself" just after a message. I think maybe I should, maybe I should change that. Um, until quite recently, it said "good luck," but I'm a bit more comfortable. So, um, so I mean, all it, all this does is you know start the client, pause for a bit, send the message, and, and send it back. I'll just show you what that looks like. I'm, I'm compiling via shade scheme. So if you were at ICFP on Monday, you'll have seen this experience report on um, running Racket on, on Shea. Shea Scheme turns out to be a fantastic back end for a programming language. And um, um, what do I call it? Message. Um, uh, it's, it's really surprisingly efficient. And Racket on Shea gives us access to all sorts of libraries. But just so you know what it looks like. Just to, um, this is oh, that's support code. So it's a lovely, readable, maintainable uh, Shea scheme there. But it um, turns out to be a really efficient way of doing things. And something Xavier said at the end of his talk about you know, what happens if OCaml just becomes a back end for a language with, with more guarantees. Hmm. That's actually exactly what I want to do. OCaml's runtime is absolutely perfect for this kind of language. So I think we could turn this into something really fast if we had an OCaml back end. Anyway, I, I, have a, I, have, I have hundreds more programs, but I don't have any time. So, um, so I'm going to stop and just say, um, no, this is, this is Idris 2. I'm having loads of fun with it. Uh, it's making good progress. Almost all of Idris 1 is there with some minor edits. It's, it's not quite completely compatible. Uh, it can't be because of quantitative type theory, unfortunately. But it's close enough that it's generally now working that we port things from the Idris 1 library, and they kind of work with, with tiny syntactic changes. Um, so QTT is helping us with erasure. That's the biggest thing about it for me. This is something that's bothered me for a really long time, and I think now we have a good story about knowing what's going to be there at runtime and what isn't. And uh, every so often, I'm, I find this new thing that I can express because I have linearity in the type, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun finding out even more things. So there's, there's still a lot of things I'd like to do with QTT that we can't quite do. So for example, I can't say 
I can't uh, do kind of borrowing. So, you know, I'm going to give you this reference to the door, and you don't have to give me a new one back as long as you promise not to touch it. So, so I think a little bit more thought about, you know, borrow things from Rust. As we know from yesterday, Rust is the programming language of choice for discerning hackers. We learned that from the programming context yesterday. So clearly we should learn things from Rust. Uh, and yeah, finally, you know, what else can we do with this interactive editing? I think we've only got a real taste for, a, a small taste of, of what is possible with asking the machine questions and getting answers. There's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more uh, vocabulary we can add to this, this possibility of, of conversation. So, so there was a talk a couple of days ago on gradual dependent type, for example. So, so can, we, can we have some kind of dynamic type checking while we understand what the program is going to do? Um, are there ways we can script the program synthesis? So essentially, the program synthesis is hard-coded. I don't think it should be hard-coded. I think we should have enough in the language that that could be written as an editor plugin. Um, so there's all sorts of uh, entertaining things uh, we could do with this. If you're interested, I'm going to be hiring someone to help with this, so please come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for listening, and thanks for waiting for lunch. It was really promising. The only thing with these is that the uh, ninety, uh, yeah, if you're ninety percent of the way there, you've done about ten percent of the work. Right. So um, I think there's going to be a talk at the ML workshop. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because they've been writing Unicode in uh, in Idris apparently. I don't think they do anything particularly exciting, but um, so that, so some people have taken it a bit further, and I, I, hopefully it'll be relatively straightforward. I mean, that's straightforward is a word you should never use. Uh, it should be relatively straightforward to port it to Idris too. Yeah, my question was how, uh, how, how, big, uh, how big is the engineering difference between Idris 2 and what is it? Is it starting from scratch? Uh, well, yeah, but um, it would be starting from scratch. No, it's changing double colons to single colons. Come on, how hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, fine. It's a, it's a reg if, if maybe there's a regular expression that makes it, but I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, yes. Oh, loads of questions. Uh, go on, then. So you showed us how types can help you do the actual programming, but that's just the first step of the life cycle of program. Yeah. And this conversation, whoever comes next that's going to change this, they don't know what your conversation was. Right. Uh, so if I remember rightly, that's work package five in our project proposal. Is <laughs> how how does re how do we do refactoring? Um, so, like, so I, I, I did a tiny thing there where I changed, uh, I changed a type in the protocol. Now, rather than the machine um, giving back an error, I think the machine should say, right, you need to change this, this, and this. We'll put holes in the right place. I have no idea how this is going to work, uh, but it has to work. You're absolutely right. It's, um, but then, you know, I, I guess the other part of your question is that um, how do you explain what the types even mean? And there is something that we have to learn as software engineers, which is uh, how, to, how to have the right balance between putting uh, loads of explanation in the type versus having a type that is meaningful to a reader. And then my rule of thumb is to start with nothing in the type and only add bits as I need it to uh, persuade the coverage checker that I've covered all of the possible inputs. This, this kind of naturally happens. Like this example with the door. Um, you learn very quickly that you need to deal with errors. So that, mean, that, that gives you a hint as a new thing you have to put in the type. But it's something we have to learn how to do. There's, there's a new thing we have to learn of effective, understandable type level programming. There will probably be you know, coding guidelines for doing that. I guess we'll work out what they are eventually, if we're lucky. Uh, yeah. Uh, you showed the example of the vectors where if you switch the addition, <laughs> then you get this sort of weirder result than what you intended. Mm -hmm. and so this in general seems like one of the issues with maybe the, the like sort of workflow of having your editor sort of fill in programs for you. And yeah. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, like how, if there are any sort of editor features that can help you assess like the program that was synthesized or maybe choose between different options that it's considering. Yeah, that would be great actually. So uh, like maybe one thing that could happen is uh, you press the button for generate a program and instead of just filling something in, it says, okay, here's some possibilities. Uh, which one of these is most likely? 
Um, so I think that there's a lot of, I think we need to put a lot of thought into the user interface of interaction with an editor. I mean, it's something I'd like, sort of imagine a tablet-like interface where, where I, can, I can have half programs in, in some scratch area and I can, I can use these as candidates and, and drag them in. And, and so there's, there's a lot of thought we need to do there. And uh, yeah, I don't have an answer to that yet. Um, yeah. At that point, uh, might it be possible to define test cases uh, which are then used to yeah. uh, select uh, the candidate? Yeah, I haven't really thought about that, but yeah, why not? That's pretty, yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'll think about that later, not now. <laughs> that, that's a great <laughs> idea, yeah. Uh, yeah, one last. Is the synthesis uh, a term enumeration, uh, a proof search, or an inversion of the, the typing? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, all of them, basically. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, it's 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 one of the possibilities. Given the type, one of the possibilities here, and uh, how do I enumerate them? And you can give it some hints. So I think that covers one of your suggestions. So the fact that it's looking at the type covers another one of your suggestions. I can't remember what the other suggestion was. So it's maybe not yet. It's maybe two thirds yet. Um, but yeah, that, so there are a lot of possibilities you could you could uh, you could use, and I think something we need to be able to do is allow programmers to have more control over it. Because at the minute, it really is just hit it with a hammer, and that's you know it's kind of cool when it works, but when it doesn't work, what do you do next? So I, I think we do need to think a bit more deeply about this. I mean, that's why I've got a project. So yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.